Thank you, Julie. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to kick off the 22-23 basketball season as part of the Speakers Bureau. Um, <clears throat> tonight's program I'm going to deal with is managing difficult situations. You may remember this from last year. This is going to kind of be a do-over for me. This comes from the fall seminar 2021 from Mr. Ray Vanacourt, uh, Connecticut Board Number 6. Um, I borrowed a lot of this uh, information from him. And what I'm hoping to do is frame my presentation tonight in kind of um, a pregame type of thing. I know for some of us out there, some of the guys that I work with and some of the ladies that I work with, they cringe when they see me as referee because they know I'm going to pull out my one and a half inch thick binder with my pregame stuff in it. We're going to we're going to talk a lot about uh, what may happen. I'm going to frame it in kind of the the elephant in the room, things that we don't want to talk about, because if we don't talk about them and they don't happen, we did good. I guess my question and the suggestion that I'll give to you throughout the evening in regards to situations that we are that are difficult for us to manage is if we don't talk about them, when will we? And what happens if a coach says, can I have those points back? Can I have that time back and nobody's taking the time to say, okay, fellas, ladies, guys, gals, what are, what are we going to do now? We, we don't want to be waiting on the floor for it. So we want to talk about it um, in, in pregame if we can. So I'm going to really focus heavily on the pregame and the situations. So when we talk about the art of effective communication, when we're managing these difficult situations, it's not really high on a lot of people's list. When you talk to veterans, officials that you know they'll probably smile at you and say i don't need no stinking pregame um they've done it and they've been there um, but all good officials have become successful because they understand the importance of at least having some communication with the partners before they go on the floor with me i can assure you if i'm your referee we're, we're going to talk and we're going to kind of touch on a lot of different things trust and communication with the crew is imperative if we're going to be successful because how we communicate verbally and non-verbally with each other while we're on the floor could help us manage these difficult situations that might arise. So let's define them, shall we? Managing is an adjective meaning having executive or supervisory control or authority. Does that sound like a basketball official to you? It does to me. How about difficult? An adjective needing much effort or skill to accomplish deal with or understand, characterized by causing hardships or problems, not easy to please or satisfy. Are we still in that ball game? Yeah, that's officiating. How about situations? A set of circumstances in which one finds oneself a state of affairs. Could we have some difficult situations in our games to manage? I would say yes, and if we pregame conference, I it, we can relieve some but perhaps not all of these issues. Remember, some of these events are not in your control. If your scoring table, your timing table is not having a good night, very possibly you may you may struggle to keep um, keep things moving. So why don't we talk about a thorough pregame? We want to take our time on making calls. We want to review double and multiple whistles with our partners. Maintain good clock awareness. You're going to see some pretty good examples of that. Last second try, who has it, who's watching, who's watching to play underneath the basket and end of quarter and uh, end of game and quarter procedures. So a good thorough pregame will help us. What should we use? How about a pregame card that IABO has taken countless years to, I won't call it perfect, but they, I'll tell you what, I challenge you to find something that isn't on that card somewhere or mentioned somewhere. Um, and of course, communication is highlighted um, in, in on this slide for you to show that good eye contact, dead ball efficiency, visually sweeping the floor, things along that line. If we just talk about those things briefly in the pregame, it may help us be better set in a frame of mind for the upcoming contest that we're about to go out and uh, take care of. This is a picture of my pregame card. When I'm looking down at my card and you're tying your shoes and rolling your eyes and going, is he ever going to shut up? Um, <clears throat> this is what my card looks like. And this is kind of the stuff that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reminding myself of. 
my my feeling on a pregame is I'm really not speaking to my crew. I'm speaking with them, but I'm reminding me, let's remember ourselves on double whistles, Mark. Find your partners, make good eye contact. Well, how about the pass crash? Who's in charge of what on a pass crash? Where? How about possession consequence? Does it? Do we really need to put air in a whistle when a rebounder is able to collect the basketball, no question there was contact, but then outlet that ball and we move down the floor? Dead ball efficiency, spot of the foul, foul shooters, held balls injured. It's all right there. This is the card and this is what I use. So if anybody wanted to uh, wonder what I'm doing when I'm staring at that card, that's what it looks like. So what are some examples of managing difficult situations? How about conversations with coaches? Again, tonight I'm just suggesting to all, I'm not telling you how we're going to do it or how you're going to officiate. We all go in with a different mindset, but if we can go out collectively agreeing that we're going to try and keep ourselves out of most of these difficult situations, we'll have a successful contest. So conversing with coaches, clock awareness, last second tries, help situations, injuries, and then here are the elephants in the room that we really, and, and I won't ask you to raise your hand or jump online right now and tell me, but do, you, do we ever really delve into these in a pregame? Do we, are we ready for that just in case moment? So let's go. We're gonna remind the crew to answer questions from coaches. Answer a question, but we're not going to debate it. We don't offer ourselves to them. Remember, officials are like fish. They only get in trouble when they open their mouth. So if you go looking for it, you're going to get bit. We're going to remind ourselves, if we do answer a question from a coach, rules-related wordings, keep the jargon to a minimum, paint and box and glass and iron, whatever else you may be using, keep it simple, keep it short. Don't delay the start of the next possession. Let's not converse when we're actively officiating. I know a many, many of our veteran officials are, are, are experts at dropping the whistle to a corner of their mouth, still continuing a conversation with a coach, but divided attention could come in there. And at that last moment, when you're talking with a coach, you have a collision or something that happens in front of you and you may not be prepared. Support each other while we're out there. <clears throat> and not these statements, not my area. I caught the last part of it. He or she's a veteran. Or the one that really gets us in trouble is not my call. Good coaches will come and say, why did I have three guys out there when you're telling me no one will rule on it? Uh, it becomes a pretty tough argument for us to say we want three guys out there or three, three officials out there when we go, nah, it's not my call. How about this first one here, clock awareness. After putting the ball in play, we check to see that the clock has properly started. Who's responsible for that? The inbounding official? after they bring the ball back and chop the time back in play, are we checking the clock to make sure after each whistle, do we have someone who makes sure that the clock is properly stopped? For example, here's a, here's a, um, a play. Let's watch the clock. Uh, we've just had a free throw, note 740. Now let's watch. I'm gonna count out loud one and two. 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006 across the midcourt division line, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, ball goes under 12, 13, boom. One second has come off the clock. I submit to you, how would you explain to a coach? Mark, we went down the floor and they scored a hoop and one second came off the clock. Who's responsible for knowing how much time sh we should, quote unquote, take off the clock? That would be that definite knowledge type of thing. But we had 13 seconds go off. How, how would we know as a group that we want to take approximately 13 seconds off that clock or any portion of that 13 seconds? So just good for us to, to, to know that. Timing mistakes. Uh, my wife is English, and I thought this was a great slide to throw up there. I love the red buses and... That's Big Ben in case some of you aren't uh, geographically uh, askew. Uh, but the timing mistakes in Rule 510, um, timing mistakes can be corrected at any time if the official has definite knowledge. So we just saw that in that previous slide where it went 13 seconds approximately before anybody, before the clock even started. Um, if we had to and the coach said, can I get some of that time back? If someone said, I had a six count in the backcourt, 
I'll take six seconds or I'll add six seconds to the, the, the clock or take it off. Um, we could do that, but if we don't have definite knowledge, um, we, we can't help them. But it says in the note, the official may use his or her account or other official information to rectify the mistake. How about if the timer leans over and goes, yeah, I, I missed almost 10 seconds. Perfect. You can use that information if you need to. If the timer's equipment fails, the red or LED light, which we don't have a lot of in Maine, or the timer signals uh, signal fails, we know that the timer must go onto the court or use other means to immediately notify the nearest official. Not sure how they do that, if they throw a clipboard at us or grab us and try and grab our pants or whatever they're doing, but um, they have a responsibility to try and notify as soon as possible that um, they've had a uh, signal failure and the period has ended or the game has ended, so we, we know that. Hopefully we would know at the end of quarter or end of game that we're getting close and that though we didn't have a time, we know that there's something up. How about scoring mistakes under rule 211? Let's talk about scoring mistakes. Here's a, here's a pretty good video for you. If you'll watch this, you'll notice that the score is circled as four. Clearly she's within the three point arc. If you'll notice the officials, um, your center officials already retreating on the shot. No signal for three, but what does the score do? Yeah, it was a three. So they put it up. Can we correct this? Still at seven, clock is still running. And we go down and we're gonna score and still nobody. At what point can we come back to um, correct a scoring error uh, that was made at the table? Um, is it correctable? So just food for thought as you go through, have that conversation with your partners, dig into the to our new rules guide that's, that's out, um, and just be familiar that if a coach comes to you and says, not sure what happened in that first quarter, and this was a pretty tough quarter for these officials because they had timing and counts and scoring errors going through, so the table is not having a good night. But if a coach came to you and said, can I, can I get one of those points taken off? Because that was a two, not a three and the, uh, the visiting team picked up an extra point on me, what would the crew do? How do we fix that? The scorer's duties, of course, are notify the official of a discrepancy. We can't, as the home book and the visiting book, fix. We, we can't figure it out. So the referee must accept the record of the official scorebook unless he or she has uh, knowledge otherwise. How would they do that? We need to remind our score and timer in our pregame at the table as the referee, Mr. Scorer or Miss Scorer, can I remind you, please, keep the progressive running team totals for us. Check with your visiting uh, book as often as possible, making sure that your bookkeeping is good. Um, if there's a, if there's, at any point you have a problem, make sure you notify me. I'm the referee for tonight's game. And I'm not afraid to sh share that with the table and tell them if at any point tonight we have a problem, my name is Mr. Bridgem, I'm the referee, please get me over sooner than later because a bookkeeping mistake can be corrected at any time until the referee approves the final score and the crew has left uh, the confines of the, uh, of the basketball floor. Um, we don't wanna be in the shower and have somebody come in and go, you guys screwed us. That's, that, that's not a good feeling when you realize an error was made and, and nothing happened or it wasn't handled well. How about on a last second try from a crew of two? From the Book of Manual, and again, this is out of the, the current um, National Federation of High Schools uh, crew of two manual. Um, the trail official has primary responsibility. If the trail is not in his half of the court and the try is attempted, the official in that half should assume that responsibility. So if it's a crew of two here, you, that lead needs to realize, where's my trail? Is he with play or is he behind it? And might I have to come out and help? It suggested the official responsible for the last second try indicate responsibility by placing their hand on his or her chest. Here's that nonverbal. Here's that, here's that I see you, you see me. I tap my chest as we're going down the floor and I begin my count in the backcourt if I'm the trail, but I've tapped my chest. I'm telling you, I have it. I will take care of it. That should relieve my my lead for some. Of, of some of the responsibility knowing that the trail has acknowledged it's mine. On the last second 
tri officials should only sound their whistle to signify the end of the quarter period when ruling a tri was not released. So if you've got nothing, you've got no whistle, you've got no air. It's imperative the primary official in the last second try signal a three point attempt, but not give the successful three point signal unless you're the responsible party for it. So if you're in the lead and you have to help your trail, you get the signal out, but make eye contact, share with your partner. It was a three and allow them the opportunity to realize I see my lead. My lead tells me it was a three. I was late getting down the floor. And I'm telling you it was a good try and your trail now picks it up and signals to the table. What we don't want to do is have somebody coming out with a no, 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 crossing their hands over and the other guy coming up with a touchdown signal. We're going to be in deep kimchi if we do that. How about a last second, last second try and a crew of three from the book of manual. The official opposite the scorer's table has the primary responsibility. If you're the trail center official is not in that half of the court, the try is attempted, the official in that half should assume responsibility for it. It suggested the official responsible for the last second try, your trail center, indicate responsibility. And once again, same, same mechanic, just tapping my chest, telling you as your trail or your center, I have it. Again, nothing different here. We're only sounding the whistle to tell somebody at the end of the quarter period, it was not released within the requirements of the, of the rule. Otherwise, get the signal up. If you're not responsible for giving the three-point signal success, get that um, get that signal to the uh, trail official or center official so that they can finish it. Or if they have to come to you for help, you can share with them. It was gone. It left their hands. You should count that basket. Give that information. Referee's duties. Um, of course, in Rule 2.5, referees' duties, we have to decide whether goal counts or doesn't. If we have to get together, we need to be able to make a decision, but the referees need to get together if they disagree on whether it should count or not. We can include the table. If the table officials agree that time expired before the ball was in flight, and we have to go to them because the crew of two or crew of three simply doesn't know, and we lean in and the table says it doesn't count, it was not gone, then it would it, the goal shouldn't count. If the table officials agree that the quarter extra period ended and before the foul occurred, that the foul should be disregarded unless it was intentional or flagrant. Again, we will come to them and um, make sure that they, they understand that. If the table officials disagree, the goal shall count or the foul sh shall be penalized unless the referee has knowledge that alters such ruling. So again, the crew should have that first shot at taking care of business. Um, let's try this. This is a great set of videos. Can we look and see? We have our trail and we have our uh, new center official. He's given a thumbs up. He's ready. This is a crew of three. This is a state 2A championship game. Watch the center official. He's going to shift a little bit, get a look through. Now step up. The ball's gone. He gives a three signal. The old trail gives a signal. That that was a strong indication that your table, sorry, your uh, official opposite the table had it all the way. What our trail official was doing at that table after is beyond me. Um, it just makes the, and I can tell you that the audio that goes with this, they're, they're, they're raising concerns that this is controversial and it never should have happened. Here's another angle. Notice your uh, center official. He now steps up, takes a look, gets a good strong signal. One, two, three, pumps it hard. That basket is good, and he's out of there. Notice that there's three officials, but there's only two in view. The other official still hasn't shown up just yet. Um, and again, he's at the table. And in this particular uh, angle, there's your center official. Here comes your trail. He's a little late to the show. Watch what happens when it goes in. He's signaling. See, the coach there is telling him, no, no, it's not. And he's going, oh, no, it doesn't count. I don't know what he's nodding, and I don't know why he's at the table. But again, as a crew, we need to remember, we need to get out of there. You want help knowing whether that got done right? Look in that top right-hand corner. <laughs> Point one on the clock. Looks like a good goal to me. We count that three, and we're out of there. Um, 
this is a good one on clock awareness in the last second try in a quarter. Uh, remembering that with three tenths of a second or less remaining on the clock, a player not may not gain control of the ball and try for goal. In this situation, only a tap could score. Watch. This this is a uh, this is really a, a a great demonstration of good teamwork and and uh, clock awareness. Watch twenty five white in the middle. A lob toss. He comes to rest. Basket goes in, Mr. Marshall goes, no, no, we can't count that, fellas. He gives it a little extra with a tap of the hand, but I think he's 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 um, allowing the coaches to know we can't count that. And the reason we can't count that is that came to rest in the hand, therefore it's a try, and you can't have a try with three tenths of a second or less. So he's signaling, nope, no basket, and then finishes with it. So that was really a great job there. How about help situations and conferences? Um, in our new rules guide that comes out, the crew of two and crew of three manual pages will change, obviously, but there may be times when it, it warrants a, a fellow crew member to come down and share with you. I saw that ball clearly leave White's hand and go out of bounds, and you're giving it back to White. We need to do that. We need to come together and make sure that we get the ruling correct. It's not so much about saving face, it's getting getting the ruling correct. Should a circumstance occur that requires an explanation, both head coaches should be invited or present at the table when you have to explain something that goes on. When we have, uh, when the clock is stopped and the ball is dead, this is dead ball efficiency. This is not time to go on vacation. This is not time to worry about if you're going to stop at McDonald's or, you know, if you're going to go somewhere else and have a, a little chimichanga or something with the boys at uh, one of the little eating places. We want to keep the um, conversation short, but communicate with our partners and the table personnel. This is absolutely imperative that we use this time to our advantage, not to have, you know, giggle, giggle talk. Injury situations. Again, these manual pages will change with the new rules guide that comes out. But we want to remember that if a player appears to require immediate attention, officials should stop the game immediately and beckon the appropriate personnel. Um, if the location of the injured player causes an imminent safety concern, we should stop. If an injured player does not appear to require immediate attention and the scoring attempt is imminent, officials should allow play to continue until that scoring attempt no longer exists or and then stop play to address the injury situation. If we enter, if we beckon an attendant or a coach onto the floor, remember that player may not re-enter unless they are uh, bought in by a timeout and they can be ready for play at the end of that timeout. Um, or if that player is ready at the, at the conclusion of the timeout, they can come back in. If bench personnel do not enter the court and the injured player is immediately ready to play, the ball should be put back in play without further delay. Um, this photograph is pretty neat because actually the kid bounced off the basketball, jumped right back up, and though the whistle was blown, the kid kind of puts his hands up um, in, 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 on the tape and, and, and shares with the, with the referee, I'm good, I'm good, and they just put the ball back in play. Um, where it was in uh, in the free throw uh, three second area, they put it uh, on the end line uh, closest to where the ball was when the, when it was whistled dead. Uh, remember uh, when we're talking about injury situations, officials should not touch or attempt to provide treatment to an injured player. Um, we're not required or we're not uh, responsible to uh, to sit there and 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 you know patch someone up. When feasible, one official should remain with the injured player until a bench personnel arrive. Certainly what we want to do is get down and say, coach is coming, stay down. You have a coach coming uh, or, or or something, but we don't want to be grabbing onto players or holding onto players. Um, and of course, during any injury delay, teams may move to their timeout areas. And if the delay is longer than a minute or two, teams should be permitted to rest in their bench area. So we can allow some freedom, but we just need to be making sure that we're taking care of the injury situation. Remember, these student athletes, it's our primary responsibility to take care of their the safety needs of, the, of, of an injured player. Uh, an official who stops play should immediately verbalize and signal how and where the ball will be put in play. 
from that point of interruption. So when we have an injury and you blow the whistle, you signal or beckon someone because you recognize that that player is um, really injured or what you feel is a, a very serious injury. Then locate with your eyes and, and verbally to your partner. Ball will be in line, belongs to white at this spot to the um, to the left or the right side of the uh, of the basket. Now, now more than one person knows in case there's an extension on this injury and they can't move that player, it could be several minutes before um, we're actually able to tend to that, uh, put the ball back in play. If we haven't told our partner or told anybody, what if you forget? We're all good to go and you stare at the basketball and now five, seven minutes after that player is wheeled off on a, on a, on a stretcher, someone goes, who's ball? And you go, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you don't remember. I mean, it's embarrassing. So you want to keep your um, fellow officials involved and let them know where as needed is that um, is that ball going to be put back into play. After conferring and verifying pertinent information, officials should move to an area of the court that's away from the injured player. Remember, as we're close to coaches, somebody may have something to say to you and it may get under your skin it may cause you to do something that you really don't want to have to do for the game. But if you're standing right there, you're going to be a target of opportunity. So when we talk about making sure that we beckon someone, as soon as you know that there's someone to attend to that player, get away and get to your positions on the floor. We've got a card coming up here in just a second that will show you our um, injury, uh, injury time locations for your officials. But it should be the safety of the player's priority first. And when doing so, we stop play. So that we did, what we hope is that an official should be wary that a kid goes down, grabbing his leg behind the play, so as to hope that the team um, could get a whistle to stop. In other words, putting the uh, putting uh, the offensive team at a disadvantage. So we want to be wary that 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 doesn't happen. Here is your injury positions um, on on your card. Notice this is a crew of two. And if we're in a crew of three, we're at the uh, jump circle closest to the table to official shoulder to shoulder approximately and someone near where the injury or the ball will be put in play with the ball on the hip in the direction in which we're going to go. Again, that helps you just remind yourself we're going back down the court um, and, and I'm going to put the ball in play for the, for the one more when the injury is taken care of. We don't put a clock on getting someone off the floor. Let the professionals handle this. Um, for example, here we have, uh, yeah. We'll watch, we'll watch this player. She stumbles, she's got an ankle. They retreat on, on the play and an official who is trailing wants the play stopped, does have play stopped. Question we have is, was it stopped at the proper time? I don't, I don't really have a problem with this. You, I, uh, your, your opinion is welcome. But again, what was really great about this is if you notice as they went up the floor, watch the center official who's coming down and, and hears the whistle go. Um, if you see it in the, in the, on the replay, he actually points to a spot right in front of the bench and says, here's where the ball's going to go. So good work on the crew um, taking care of business and getting the ball back in play once we knew um, that player is being tended to by a coach. Down she goes, ball comes up, watch your center official whistle. There's an injury, boink, great job. Here again, we're going to have a young man go to the, go to the basket. He's gonna get cranked right in the face. Not sure what the visiting coach is doing. He's wandering out there for a second. He's having a little chat with his fellas. Official looks down at the uh, uh, at the injury. He's signaling, hey, somebody needs to come out. We have more than one staff member coming out. Um, the trail now has a conversation. I don't know who the primary is, the, the, the head coach, but someone is tending to the injured player. Um, there is a short conversation. Of course, the visiting coach is taking advantage to have a quick huddle with his players. Perfectly legal. 15 was the injured player, and we're going to get a substitute in the game. Nobody really beckons a substitute in, but the officials are going to get things moving here in a, in a moment. Not sure if there was a horn again. I don't 
I have my audio going with it, but it looks like number 10 is going to come in and shoot those free throws. So we're using the correct process to get somebody to the to the free throw line. And at some point we're going to get play started again. It's going to be two shots. He's going to signal it's two and we're going to move on from there. Um, Again, did we official, did the official properly beckon a coach? I'm going to tell you sure for the injury, but did we get did we get the substitute in? Again, if we're if we're doing an evaluation, that could be something we write down. Remember, we want to make sure we beckon all substitutes onto the floor. When the head coach or other person are beckoned onto the floor to attend to an injured player, that player must leave the game unless they use a timeout, 30 or 60, and it, the situation can be corrected by the end of that timeout. Um, Julie shared with me last night uh, when we were chatting about getting ready for this tonight. Um, this play actually happened in Bangor maybe a year or two ago. What we cannot see from this, and we were just talking about how officials don't render first aid. Uh, this kid actually has a broken nose and he's bleeding like there's blood coming. And you can see the, the green kid from uh, looks like Fort Kent. He's got a nod on his head from probably where that nose bounced off his forehead, but the officials grabbing a, a towel to try and render or to control the amount of blood that's coming from this young man. And uh, Julie shared that the the dude that runs the blood up there at uh, at the at the cross center said he'd never seen that much blood on the floor from this type of a, a, an injury. But again, this is an exception to that rule. Most of the time, we're not going to go grabbing towels and scratching you know uh, rubbing people's knees or elbows when they have little boo-boos we're going to get them out of the game or the coach is going to buy them in with a timeout so the blood procedure if we're bleeding and it's judged to be excessive play is stopped immediately that's black and white we have rule support for that the player is bleeding has a open wound and the blood is on his or her uniform or person that player shall be directed to leave the game again we're going to stop and have them go coach 10 blood on the knee. Players may not re-enter until the blood situation has been rectified. So if a coach wants to buy a timeout to get them back in the game, they may certainly do that as long as they're ready at the conclusion of the timeout. So let's watch this one here. You're looking at this young lady just down here at the top of the at the top of the uh, uh, three-point arc. He saw blood on her right knee and stopped to play immediately to get her out of the game. That was clear. It was blood being shown. It was seen. And you can see it clearly from this camera angle. He's like, no, not comfortable. We must, by rule, we must, uh, we must remove her and, and get that blood sorted. And then he points to a spot where the ball is going to be put in place. So another good job there. A player bleeding has open wound on his uniform must leave unless they buy their way back in with a timeout. And it can be, the situation can be corrected by the end of the, time um I, other and these are the elephant in the room I'd, I'd love to change that slide and pull it uh, call it the elephant in the room calls uh these these are the events that we don't talk about and i'll tell you why we don't talk about them because if we don't talk about them they won't happen and then we've had a great game but i guess the question is what happens if that elephant comes out on the floor and somebody goes okay what are you going to do now and there are three of us out there and we go geez we didn't talk about that so let's let's chat real quick about this. How about the fighting rule? That is a that can be confusing. It can be upsetting. It can be um, emotional. It can be that oh, you've got to be kidding me, not tonight. Um, but watch this video. Does the crew handle this play properly? Which official is responsible for the bench area? Crew of three. There's your scrum. Now it turns into more. Here comes some additional help. Oh, and here comes the third guy. Great. That that really doesn't help us because what, what happens here? Well, we're going to see it stop. The officials closest to the play start moving towards the altercation. Now there's a scrum. Here comes the head coach. We know by rule she's okay, but guess what? Yep. B6 and B7 want to come. The official away from play should focus on the bench area, but he decides he's going to come in and help. Now look, there's B8 and two assistant coaches. So the only one left is B9. Now we're not going to know that because um, you know the 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 
coach of White's going to say there were nine or ten blue players on the floor. They all have to leave. They can't do that. And we're not going to be able to look at each other and go, Mark, you were the trail. Who came out on the floor for blue? Three, three, letter, uh, three things, a statement I'm going to make. I don't know. It's not the right answer. So think about that in your, in your fight situation. If you're working, especially if working a crew of three, you have the advantage of somebody who can turn and see the bench areas and make sure that the benches are behaving in the event you have this fight situation. Of course, whoops, the referee's duties uh, in fighting, uh, if the referee has to, and it's, um, I, I wanna say there was a, a school up in the, the central main area a few years ago that had a, had a school in and there was a Donnybrook and the game had to end rather quickly because a number of players got ejected for fighting. The referee has the ability to declare a game of forfeit when conditions warrant. If you cannot gain control and the, the schools don't wanna play nice, end it. Write it up and send it to your your, your interpreter and to the the, the the director of officiating and just let him the coordinator of officials and let them let them sort it out with the main principal association. You're not responsible for like this officials in the middle of this mess right now and he's got a hold of somebody. That's a good opportunity for for that guy to get a free swing and knock that official. So be careful when you get involved in these in these fights. Make sure you you've got your six covered. Because if you're staring at somebody and, and if somebody comes up from behind you and knocks you down, um, not not a good situation. Um, uh, when you're stopping play for a timeout or for stopping for a, a, a fighting, again, when timeout occurs and the clock in front of you must be stopped when the official stops play because of an unusual delay, how's this? You've got a mascot out there amongst all these knuckleheads running around screaming and hollering and, and, and it's delaying the start of the game uh, or the the pick up picking the game back up um if you have to stop play you may have to you may have to do that to gain control and remember you want home management and anyone else that's that's there from law enforcement to to take care of those things don't don't do that yourself don't go into the crowd don't go after the crowd you're there to um officiate a basketball game you're not there to uh, take care of a boxing match or people that want to fight if you have a timeout for uh, during during play for a coach who requests a correctable error, here you can see an official kind of <laughs> he's looking at he's looking at the book. He looks just like I would in the middle of the game, at a distance uh, at that uh, at that um, at that book, and he's telling you that there's a timing scoring or some sort of an error that needs to be put in that book. The, the key to this is in rule 210, which we never like to talk about, the correctable error. Remember that the appeal of officials shall be presented at the scores table where a coach of each team may be present. Remember, don't, don't exclude a coach. Make sure you ask, coach, I, I've got a bookkeeping error. Coach, can I have you come to the table and let them make the decision whether they want to be there. Remember, if there's no correction made, regardless of the amount of time consumed, only one 60 second timeout is charged or one 30 second timeout if that's the only type remaining. If the error or mistake is prevented or rectified, we don't charge any timeouts. Here's your correctable error. I love this. I found this slide last night. This dog really wants to take a hold of that Big Mac. Yeah, he does, but he knows he's going to get caught because he's on video. Yeah, that's me. But let's look at correctable errors. Four of the five correctable errors are during free throw. So if our crew is working tight, we can get the right guy, the right gal to the right end of the uh, of the court shooting the right number of free throws and avoid four out of the five oopses on correctable error. And of course the other one is erroneously counting or canceling a score. So just food for thought when you're talking about correctable error with your partners in pregame, four of the five are during free throw. Ball is dead. There's time to look at each other and say five will shoot two free throws. And if anything happens after that, you know that uh, you've got help from your partners knowing that number five is going to go to the free throw line and shoot two shots because you've said it several times to your partner or partners. Remember that the correctable error must be recognized uh, no later than during the first dead ball after the clock has properly started in order to be corrected. So here's a summary of when the correctable error and involves failing to award a merited free throw, 
this slide is good. You can snap a picture of that and put that in your pregame book. My one and a half inch binder just got a little thicker. Activity during an unmerited free throw only counts if it's unsporting, flagrant, intentional, or technical. Otherwise, all fouls would be canceled if the error is corrected um, during the unmerited free throw. Remember that the wrong player, wrong basket, point scored, consume time, or additional activity that occur prior to the recognition of the error must not be nullified. Um, these are just going through what we had on your fingers and your thumb. Errors because of free throw attempt at the wrong basket. If an error is corrected, play must be resumed from the point of interruption unless it involves awarding merited free throws and there's been no change of team possession. So again, this is that aha moment where you walk by your partner, you've gone to the table, you realize that you need to do free throws. This is where when you're having that conversation quickly with your partner, you're saying White was in possession, White should have been awarded um, a, a one and one. And we didn't do that. We put the ball back in play. Your partner can share with you, fine, let's just go down, set them up and let's go. We'll take it for, uh, off, off the free throws. If we've had a change of possession, then we may have to go from a point of interruption. I have covered a lot. You've had the elephant in the room conversation. You've had those conversations that we normally have in our pregame, but I can't stress enough to you that um, preventing game preventing officiating starts with a thorough pregame conference. If you discuss with your crew how you're gonna handle things, these situations, these difficult or challenging situations for which game you work, there can be some trust and communication between you because you know that no one's going to let you walk off the cliff because it comes back to the crew that, that someone needs to change what we're doing out there. And that can only be done by having that conversation uh, with, with your partners. Now, remember, this conversation may vary based on the experiences of the members of your crew. If you've got a very young a uh, group of officials that you're working with that night, you may have to be on your toes and, and, and take some extra time uh, to make sure that things are being handled correctly. Keeping the pregame conference on course and discussing best practices should no less than cover good immediate eye contact, slow down after your whistle at the primary spot at the site of the foul, no preliminary signals on foul calls. We want to make sure that we, we, we give good preliminary signals, but uh, make sure that we're not doing anything outside of the, the uh, manual. Good court and clock awareness. Come together when a conference is needed. Hopefully we're not there five or six times in a night. But if we have to get together two or three times in a night to bring us back to the right ruling, that's a good night. And a good night can be ruined in an instant if officials don't keep ahead of the game and their heads in the game. So don't be afraid to, to challenge your partners uh, with focus. Uh, let's keep going. We've got 10 seconds left in this game. We've done 31 minutes and 50 seconds of good work. Let's not lose it now. Um, Pre-game planning of challenging situations by crew gives us the best chance of a smooth game result. My bad. 44 minutes, covered a lot of ground. I thank you for your time. I hope you have a warm, a safe, and a healthy season. Thank you, folks.